All right, Corne this chapter 32, coronary artery disease. How many times have y'all heard about coronary artery disease? A lot. I mean, you can just sit at home and watch TV and never go anywhere and learn about coronary artery disease. We already know modifiable and non-modifiable. So, um, you know, increased lipids, hypertension, smoking, gender, race, all that, right? So, and y'all understand <coughs> what happens inside the coronary, remember the coronary arteries like the hand veins like or vessels? artery. So you've got, these are your coronary arteries, sort of. Um, so eventually what happens is, what was that? Scoot the Oh. <laughs> you know, deposits start building up inside these coronary arteries. They keep building up plaque. Um, diabetes is really bad about this, building stuff up in here. And when all this kind of, it gets kind of scratchy on the inside, it's not smooth and pretty on the inside. You know, these are like smooth as glass and like all the blood flow and red blood cells scoot past. Well then, these kind of get scratchy and then they might pop open. And so a red blood cell, as it goes by, will catch or snag on them. And then they'll burst open. So they'll burst open. And what happens when we burst open a red blood cell? Blood goes through. Cellular debris, but that causes an inflam inflammatory process. Mm -hmm. So what comes, anytime a red blood cell, you cut yourself, what happens? All those platelets go to make a clot because we want to stop that bleeding. So now what have we done? We've made a clot over it and blocked the artery. So now is there any blood flow getting down here? No. So let's see. Here's the hole. This is the whole heart. So like this one will go down that way. And this circumflex kind of goes around this way. So, so from here down in this, wherever that all their little branches feed to, there's no blood flow getting to that heart muscle. It's the same principle with a stroke. If somebody has a blood clot in their brain, it blocks that blood flow to that part of the brain, and that brain part of the brain doesn't get blood flow and dies. So both strokes and heart attacks are time is muscle, time is brain. So then all this, so then it becomes, starts becoming ischemic, can get necrotic. If we don't get to the hospital as soon as possible to open this back up, then what's going to happen is all this is going to die. And then that part doesn't move at all. So just one little part moves. So of course then that makes your cardiac output go down. And then we go to CHF. So. So now if, the, if, a, if we have the problem going over here, we have it going over here too. We have it way down here. So we have a potential to clot off or block. So then y'all heard people say I had triple ve vessel bypass. That's what that is. There's triple <laughs> vessel. You can have quadruple and you can have um, up, up to five bypasses. So, so y'all see how that so coronary artery disease will start clogging these up, okay? And then diabetes, to me diabetes has, their blood is sugary. 
So if you imagine little grains of sugar in their blood, so that's kind of scratchy, going through all the little tiny blood vessels and stuff, or kind of gets like molasses. So actually diabetic patients, they have a higher risk because all that sugar starts getting kind of built up in here. And then plus their blood vessels get real skinny. These coronary arteries get real skinny. And so they have an increased risk of even blocking these off quicker. Does that make sense? No. So, when we start to have a blockage here, the first, then we're going to have chest pain. That's when we, we do the Mona. But while they're at home, they need to take nitroglycerin sublingual. How often can they take it? <coughs> Every five minutes. Every five minutes. times. Or times three. It's still unrelieved after the third time. Where are you going? ER. To the ER. Don't stop to clean the house. You need to go. Don't stop and think, well, maybe if I rest a while. No. A friend of mine called me over the weekend, and uh, she had chest pain for like an hour and a half, a couple of days, on and off. And I'm like, <coughs> go to the doctor. <laughs> go to the ER now. So she finally went. And she did have a heart attack. Um, it was, but it was all small vessel disease, so they couldn't do anything about it. They just have to wait for new blood vessels to grow back. So, um, now something in the book was saying that um, I don't know if it's true for just coronary artery, but for eyes and things too, that uh, diabetic patients don't necessarily feel the same pain that well, we would that. feel. Well, I'm Why assuming because of neuropathy. Okay. Absolutely. That's what I wanted to know. If I was Diabetics can have a heart attack and not even know it. Okay. They may kind of feel something funny while they're shopping at Walmart. And then just like, well, I don't know what that was. Or else all of a sudden they get sweaty and turn gray and they're in the middle of Walmart. And then you see EMS taking them out. So, but lots of times they don't feel it because they've got that neuropathy not only in their feet that you yeah. see the commercials about but in their heart so yeah they don't they cannot feel it um so if they're having chest pain at home nitroglycerin sublingual q5 or q5 minutes times three now so if we block this off and this is getting ischemic all these little cells these heart muscle cells they start kind of breaking apart and releasing enzymes. What are the enzymes that get released? Cytokines. Troponin. Troponin. And they're the CKs. Myoglobin. Myoglobin. And the CKMB, that's that creatinine, creatinine kinase yeah. stuff. MB is specific to um, to the heart. So anytime anybody comes in, which I surely they still do this. If anybody comes in with chest pain at all, don't ever give them an IM shot because that will because when you give an IM, that also releases enzymes from the from muscles too. So, but they will do, if somebody comes to the hospital with chest pain, they'll check all these and then they do them again like every eight hours. Q8 times three. The troponin has, 
has become like the gold standard that they just draw and use. Back when I first started out, troponin was not even heard of. So we always went by the CKs. What does that stand for? Creatinine kinase. And these will, so if somebody even waits eight hours to come in, some of these will still be elevated. So that way they know that they've had a cardiac event. Okay. How long do they stay elevated up to? It, there's a chart in your book and it tells how okay, long, like, to kind of these go up, those get elevated and up, they start to increase troponin and CKs in one to three hours. Okay. Then they peak, I think at like different times, I think the CK peaks in like 18 hours. Or 12, something like that. 18 to 24. <coughs> 18 to 24. That's the CK. That's the CK. And how long does troponin? It, they start to rise in one to three hours and then the troponin? Uh, the I is in 24 hours and the T is in 12 to two days. So. Two days. I think that the troponin T is the one they use. And that's the that's the one lab that you'll hear. Was there troponin up? Was there troponin up? about all those risk factors and modifiable and non-modifiable. Yeah. I mean, those are like common sense. Um, if somebody comes in with chest pain also, they're going to do a 12, that 12 lead EKG. They're going to hook them up to the monitor that we did. You know, our little five lead salt, pepper, ketchup, bun pickle. But then, they're, then the EKG tech's going to come in and do a 12 lead EKG on them. And then if you've taken a bunch of courses, then you can read it. If not, the doctor will read it and tell you. <laughs> and so they're going to look for ST elevation or ST depression. A STEMI is an ST elevation. MI. And then a non STEMI is non ST elevation. So, so now that's that little, like the P, Q, R, S, and then the, so we've got the P. QRS and then T right there. So they'll either look for this to go way up or this to go way down. That ST segment there. I'm not going to have that on the test. I'm not going to make y'all decide whether it's elevated or inverted. Unless y'all want me to. You want me to put a rhythm strip on there? No. And y'all tell? <laughs> Whatever. Y'all knew those. Yes. Now your book has got. Actually, I saw that this week doing the emergency room that ST elevation. You did. And I, and I recognized that's what it was, and they were there for. We'll that. see. Oh, that's pretty cool. Just, just read about it. You can see it. I mean. We'll see. That works. Let me back up just a little bit. Um, angina. Angina is chest pain. There are different kinds of chest pain. We have stable. So that means if I go mow the grass, I'm going to have chest pain. And I know that. So it's predictable. It's predictable. And 
it's relieved by rest. So if I'm out mowing the grass, if I go sit down, then I'll quit having it. Or I can take one nitro and know that it'll be go away. And then there's Prins Metal or Variant Angina. This is a spasm. And these are usually treated with calcium channel blockers. They're unpredictable too, right? I mean, they are no unpredictable. Wind. These are unpredictable. The spasm. Uh, what the coronary artery does is it'll spasm shut and then open it back up. Spasm shut and then open back up. I don't know when that's going to happen, but um, they can see that when they do a cath lab, to go to the cath lab and they, but um, so they do calcium channel blockers to keep it open, to keep from having that spasm. Basically, it's like a Charlie horse in your. So what do you take if you have a Charlie horse? Eat a banana yeah, potassium. and pot potassium or and calcium. And calcium. Mm -hmm. So that's what you do the, for that. <coughs> then there's the the other one, which is related to the STEMI mm -hmm. under the ACS guidelines. Unstable. You don't know when it's going to happen. It's not predictable and not relieved by rest. And you usually do have to take nitroglycerin for this. It feels the most like a heart attack and can actually become a heart attack or lead to a heart, like the, it's the same signs and symptoms as a heart attack. So that's why they have come up with that STEMI and non-STEMI under a, a cor acute coronary <coughs> syndrome because they were people were just being well that's just unstable angina you can just go home or you know just take your nitro or whatever because then they'd see so then they do they'd come in with unrelieved chest pain and then do an EK, EKG and it would have no ST elevation so they'd be like you're okay that friend of mine over the weekend she never had ST segment elevation, nothing. She didn't, her EKG was fine, so, but she still had a heart attack. So Did that's they why they had- out from the enzymes or were they able to just- No, she finally had a calf. They even did a stress test on her while she was having a heart attack. <laughs> they made her do a stress test. Oh my test. gosh. <laughs> <Where was it>? <laughs> <laughs> well. I'm not saying. <laughs> now it was actually in Chattanooga, but it wasn't because of the hospital, it was because of her particular physician. So she now has a new physician who did a cap on her and told her what was wrong. So anyway, so that's unstable angina, is unpredictable, it looks like a, can look exactly like a heart attack. So then we go into these non stemmy and STEMIs. You do different things for the STEMI, the glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors. <laughs> what? What? Mm -hmm. <laughs> glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors. They look like, you'll see them in your book under the. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Huh? I was <laughs> about that. Just heard the word and it gave me anxiety. I so know. <laughs> it's Agristat. Agristat is one. What, now, what do these do? Hang on. Oh, I'm sorry. The Agristat and. 
I can't think of that. Integrally. Now, these chew up platelets. They chew up platelets. Okay. Have both for STEMI and non STEMI? Um, they can use them for both. There's one, I think, the, S, the STEMI that they really use them for. I have to double check in the book. Um, but they actually will chew up this platelet, try to. And what it'll do is it'll just like make it, keep making it smaller and smaller and smaller. It won't like get rid of it, but it'll just make this little spot right here just get smaller and smaller so then we can establish blood flow around it. Okay. These are not the same thing as the clot busters. The clot buster will go in there and just get rid of that whole thing. They're quick. But these just sort of chew up the platelets, <coughs> or kind of chew up that fibrinous clot that kind of gets there. They kind of kind of just whittles it down. And they do and they do what? The, you said that you said they eat you said eat, eat the like they platelets and that oh, fibrin. Chew up the platelets. So they just make it smaller and smaller and smaller. They don't go in there and just throw the hammer down on them like um, streptokinase does. So they're a little bit safer to use. So if somebody has had a car wreck, a previous heart attack, um, any kind of surgery, a stroke, any of that, they can't have any of those clot busters, the streptokinase, because it'll cause them to replete. So there's a whole list of stuff you have to go through and check off to make sure somebody can get a clot buster. Usually how I think of getting given clot busters where the streptokinase is when they're at like an outlying hospital and they know they can't get them to somewhere fast enough to get them to the cath lab. So they'll give them there just to save that heart muscle. But then when they get to the cath lab, then we have to wait because we can't <laughs> stick the femoral artery. <laughs> so. <coughs> So I don't know, I'm thinking about these, but I do have a PowerPoint that talks some more about these. Okay. Take pictures of them. Yeah. <laughs> if you're gonna ask questions, if not. So we'll just take those right now. It's not posted. No <laughs> okay. Now, it has all these tests in here, but that was, y'all should have done all that from last test. So I'm not gonna ask you about all those tests. The only thing that we are going to talk about are um, the cath lab and how they fix stuff. So we've already talked about um, 12 ED. We did already did the EKG changes. I don't want y'all to have to know what but the circumflex feeds, you know, a certain part, or the RCA feeds the inferior. Y'all will learn all that when y'all grow up. <laughs> when y'all grow up. <laughs> so, I mean, this this does have a lot of stuff in here, but a lot of it, like it, the aortic bloom pump and stuff, y'all don't need to know that at all. You have no, no, no need to know that. No need to know what? A bloom pump. So, they come in with chest pain if they're at home, nitroglycerin times three, Q, um, Q5 minutes apart. If that's unrelieved, they need to call or go to the ER. They're going to get a 12 lead EKG, EKG. They're going to check their enzymes. If they're still having chest pain, they're going to go into Mona. They're going to diagnose them whether that's some type of angi angina or if it's a STEMI or non-STEMI. And then they're going to go to the cath lab. Pretty much. That's not that hard, is it? Mm -hmm. Make team questions over there. I'm sure I can. <laughs> 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 um. So once they get into the cath lab and they've got this clot right here, they just go in. They stick a wire down and they thread a balloon in right here. <coughs> and 
You know, and everybody gets stents now. You know, cardiothoracic surgeons used to make the most money. Well, besides neurosurgeons, but cardiothoracic surgeons used to. Because this, um, not about 1993 is when they really started trialing stents in the heart. So it hadn't even been that long. Of course, I still think the 90s are 10 years ago. I guess the older you get, the more you think that. But um, so I guess that was like 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago. So, and in 90, about 97, around in there, they really started using them a lot, a lot. So, they haven't been around that long, so what has happened is that make, has made the cardiothoracic surgeons hungry. They're not as, they don't have as much money anymore. Oh, that's so pitiful. Poor guys. <laughs> because the cardiologists now are making all the money. You know, an open heart surgery case, this is from years ago, would be, you know, a hundred thousand dollar and then you know we can go to the cath lab and get a stent and they used to be and they're probably cheaper now I, I mean I don't know I will well know with the drug eluding stents I bet they're still the same now because those drug eluding stents are expensive but and this would be a a week stay I mean, this is so. This is vast improvement on <coughs> even the lo the longevity of of everybody. So when they get to the cath lab, they find the clot right here and thread a wire, stick a balloon in. Right there, they blow up the balloon and all this stuff. There's your balloon. It gets oh. smashed over here. They just go and pump it all out. Well, we don't have to know about the balloon. Yes, I'm going to know the balloon. This is a different This balloon. is a different. This is completely different. Do we need to know about this balloon? We'll just, how about the process? I'm not going to test you on which balloon it is and the length and the size. <laughs> I mean, I, we, this could be a 3.0 by a 15. <laughs> I worked in the cath lab for many, many, many years. So, but, so you come in and you see that no, there's no blood flow to the heart, and then you put the balloon in and pop it open, and then it's instant gratification. I mean, you can just see them, and you can actually hear the patients go. <gasps> I mean, I, it stops. Everything stopped. So, and then now they put in these little stents to help keep them open. Now, and what, like, Debbie was talking about, this can, since it's a foreign object, it'll grow scar tissue around it. But those dr new drug eluding stents, which they're not really that new anymore, help to keep the scar tissue down. But I guess now there's a drug also that'll help keep it even less from growing there. We have too many blockages. They're going to do open heart surgery if the if we can't stent them all. So what's going to happen is there's the aorta. So what the cardiac surgeon does is he punches a hole in the aorta, gets a vein from your leg, and builds a bridge over Hamilton Place at Chattanooga, or Hamilton Merry Place Christmas. at Christmas. <laughs> so, so this all right here might, but then all, we can still perfuse this whole part of the heart muscle. And the same thing here, he'll draw, he'll build another bridge. That's bypass. That's bypass. Coronary artery, dis, or coronary cabbage. artery bypass cabbage. grafting, cabbage, CAB. So. so now, when they do that and you still have that, that's bad. Does that area there just, I mean, what happens there? If, 
If we can't I mean, I realize that we're getting the blood where we need it to go, but you still have that blockage there. What will happen is that they will grow vessels. Oh, okay. <coughs> that will grow up. Okay. They grow collaterals. And so that friend of mine had a heart attack. We're just waiting. The doctor's just waiting for her collaterals to start growing to feed those spots. Okay. So you actually grow new blood vessels. The best way to have grow collaterals is to exercise. So the best way to grow collaterals is to exercise. And that just because if you're exercising, you know, then your heart's working hard. And so you'll just grow more vessels to feed that heart while it's working. Moderate exercise, light yeah. exercise. Probably not so much light, but you know, probably walking every day. It doesn't have to be like you don't have to do like Jane Fonda aerobics. So somebody who had heart failure could probably do enough exercise. They could, but I don't know if they would be able to. Mm -hmm. That would be the only thing. Just That's because why I of their if they would be too much activity for them to be able to do that. No, if they go to cardiac rehab and they are getting monitored, although every cardiac patient should go to cardiac rehab, they should go to cardiac rehab because then that will help them get back into that exercise to help kind of grow those collaterals and strengthen the heart to do better, and, but they're being supervised. Probably not. And do you think these kind of people are going to do it on their own if they didn't do it before? No. There's a term out there called a cardiac cripple. Anytime they have a, anybody has a cardiac event. Even if they get fixed, we'll be scared to death to do something ever again. So they go home and just sit. And that's the worst thing that you can do for them. They've got to get out and do something. Exercise, get up out of the chair, something. So that's why they really push people to go into cardiac rehab. And they eat. They sit in the chair and eat. And then we start the whole process over again, right? And then eventually we go into congestive heart failure. So then we start that whole mess over again. <laughs> so they've got to get up and get moving. And then cardiac rehab will also like help them meal plan and all that. And then what if they're diabetic on top of all this? Now, let's see. And so these same patients, after they have their MI, they're going to get beta blockers. They're going to be on ACE inhibitors. They're going to have nitroglycerin. All the same drugs. It's all the same stuff. It is. So, um, talks about post-op from um, a coronary artery um, from. A cabbage. Now we'll be testing you on some of this stuff. Now, in the cath lab. your way and I'm going to stick your femoral artery okay with a big old sheath it's like eight centimeters long okay so after I do all this and I leave the cath lab we got to pull it out but we've been given heparin while we're in the cath lab so we have to wait until our blood is clotty enough to pull this out. 
So it could be four to six hours. So how do you think they're laying? On back. Back, yeah. flat. Yeah. Who, who wants to lay on their back flat for four to six hours? No one? No one. <laughs> so they need, so while they're doing this, they need drugs, don't they? <laughs> Anti-anxiety drugs, all that. TV, family member or something, unless the family member's annoying. Uh, then we can pull out the sheet. So after this, after our, P, our PTT gets back to normal, then we can pull the sheet. And so now we got a, it's an artery. It's the second biggest artery besides our jugular right there, or carotid, I mean. So I got to hold pressure times at least 20 minutes. So if you're the nurse pulling out the sheath, make sure you've gone to the bathroom. And then they're going to have a big pressure dressing that'll be stay on for like um, 12 to 24 hours because you don't want this thing to pop back open because they will fire hose and bleed out. So I've gone in here. I've got a big sheath in this spot. What do I need to check while they're laying in the bed? Distal pulses. Check color, sensation, and movement. Make sure they're not blanched white or tingling or blue and they can move them. Now you should also check all this before they go to the cath lab so you know if there's any differences. What if you do, what do you do if you can't feel feel a pulse? You can get a Doppler. What if you can't Doppler? Call the doctor. And then he's going to call a vascular surgeon. <laughs> and then they're going to have to have surgery again. So, so you have to check all these pulses. And they may still have chest pain, even after it's been fixed. So they still will need, they probably will still need nitroglycerin and they might need some morphine. And then the rest of the time, they're just gonna lay and wait and make sure they're okay. They're gonna get 12 lead EKGs and they're still gonna be hooked up to the monitor. And then they can get up and walk around and make sure it doesn't pop back open while they're walking around and then they can go home. That was easy. Open heart surgery. By the way, if anybody says they have a sense of impending doom, they may not say, I have a sense of impending doom. <laughs> but if they're like, I don't think I'm going to make it, stop right there in your tracks and get back and talk to them. Because I probably know something's going to happen. So, before surgery, they have to be prepped. Prepped surgery. And talk to them, answer their questions ad nauseum. Because the more they know and the more comfortable they feel, the better they will come out of it. Come out of a cabbage. So they're gonna split their sternum open. They actually take a saw and saw it open. If they don't go in that way, they do do, uh, they can poke little holes and do robotic surgery through about like right, somewhere right in here between the ribs. And they can do the little robot, you know, it's like a, looks like a Nintendo thing. <laughs> game and they can go in there and actually fix 
you know, actually attach the blood vessels to bypass them. Is that the way things are moving now? Is more of a because they saw it. Tiny, they're tiny holes, you know, they're not having to do these big holes and stuff. Um, anytime that you have a valve replacement, they do have to soccer your sternum pretty much. There is, I think, one valve that they can replace now robotically and fix. I can't think of which one. It's probably the, it's either the mitral or aortic. But. So they go to surgery, they have to have, they either are on the pump or off the pump. On the pump, that means that they have a heart-lung machine, and there's like a person that's actually trained to take care of this machine during open heart surgery. So, Is that like the bypass part? That's the bypass, well that's, it's just called the heart-lung machine. Okay. So, this is under anesthesia. We have to um, make sure that that they're doing okay in the surgery, but then when they come out, after they put all the blood back into the body, we have to watch for strokes. check all kinds of stuff because this is major surgery. Usually it takes anywhere from three to six hours for the surgery. <clears throat> and you want to check, make sure that they have good blood, blood, good blood pressure. Their heart rate's okay. So everything's getting back to normal. This is probably one of the number one things you gotta look for, especially in old people. Because once they go in there and kind of open up the heart and do stuff in there, they've got a lot of calcium. And a lot of these strokes that they have are from calcium coming on. So, um, you have to check their leg incisions. All in their chest incisions. So, who's already costing more money? <laughs> Which requires a nurse to do more work? This one. This, these are when they come out from surgery. Should be a one-on-one. -on -one. Most hospitals do make them be a one-on-one. -on -one. That's your only patient. You have to do vital signs Q15 minutes. You're going to be on IV drips. They're going to have one of those Swan GANS catheters in. That hemodynamic, hemodynamic chapter. That was apparently my chapter. Oh, was it? That huh? <laughs> I did write those test questions. So sorry. Um, so they'll have that swan in to look at pressures. They have to be warmed up because when they're in the OR, they are cold. You'll get them back from surgery and they might have a temperature of like 96.8, something like that. So if they're cold, what does that do to your blood vessels? Constrict them. them. So does that make their heart work harder? Mm -hmm. So we have to warm them up. They have, um, you can get those warm blankets or they have what's called a bear hugger. And it's a blanket that looks like a big hair dryer like thing. <laughs> and you lay on it. <laughs> or that you put it on top of it and it blows all this hot air. It looks like a looks like a raft. 